this evening. Um, tonight is the second of our three webinar series entitled Living with Epilepsy and it's brought to you by the Epilepsy Foundation of Texas and Central and South Texas. We're here to serve families living with epilepsy in the state of Texas and offer support and education to overcome the challenges of epilepsy. If you'd like more information about the foundation, um, you can find the agency fact sheet and uh, other handouts in the handout section along with some other handouts in the um, area to the right where you may see um, where there's handouts and a five, there's five handouts including the PowerPoint presentation that uh, we'll be going over this evening. Okay. Also, if you have any questions for the speaker, please type them in the comment box, and we will have them answered at the end. There's um, at the, or in the chat in the chat uh, box, you can uh, type in any questions, and we'll make sure that um, the speaker gets those. And also, at the very end of of this webinar, there's a survey um, uh, at the end of this webinar. We would greatly appreciate that you complete with the number of people that are uh, listening in with you, watching with you. Um, we get this information so that we'll know um, how we're doing with the webinar, if this is something that we should continue doing, if this is something that you would do again, um, we would like to collect that information. So again, we'd like to thank you, and now I would like to uh, introduce to you our speaker for tonight, and that is uh, Dr. Rebecca Schultz. Um, she's an assistant uh, professor at Baylor College of Medicine, sections of pediatric and neurology, and the lead pediatric nurse practitioner in the comprehensive epilepsy program at Texas Children's Hospital. She also serves as an adjunct faculty at Texas Women's University. She received her BSN from UT Health Science Center in Houston. MSN from UT School of Nursing, a graduate school of biomedical science in Galveston, and PhD in nursing science from Texas Women's University. She is the chair of the professional advisory board for the Houston Epilepsy Foundation and serves on the professional advisory board for the National Epilepsy Foundation and for Houston Dallas Fort Worth Epilepsy Foundation. She has nearly 30 years experience as a pediatric nurse pr practitioner specializing in the care of children and adolescents with epilepsy. Her research interests include transitioning adolescents with epilepsy, psychosocial aspects of epilepsy, and efficacy and side effects of the ketogenic diet for the treatment of epilepsy. She lectures on the local, state, and national level on the topic of epilepsy and transitioning adolescents with epilepsy to adult care. Here. So without further ado, I'm passing it over to Dr. Rebecca Schultz, and she will um, have her presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to have you um, <clears throat> on board uh, this evening. Um, so uh, looks like we have about uh, 14 of you out there. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to me to do a webinar because I uh, can't see people and know where you are, but uh, welcome and uh, hope that uh, I can give you some good information this evening. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to be talking about seizures and, and treatment options for seizures. First, we'll start with a uh, little video here, though, about 1 in 26. Hey, had a sweet show last weekend, playing new tracks with thousands of people. Cannot wait for the remix contest this weekend at the festival. Music creates this vibe that brings people together. It doesn't matter where you're from. No one cares that I am one. Looking forward to teaching my first Tommy Play class of the semester this afternoon. But I gotta hit the gym first. Working out? Relax and fit. Not to mention, I just want to get some of my best ideas. Tonight's going to be fun. In fact, my husband and I are going out to celebrate his new job and the paper I just got published. Oh, that reminds me. I better scope out a place. To my family, students, and faculty, it doesn't matter that I am one. Okay, I got this. That's me. So I have to present a new project plan to a group of 30 colleagues. Oh, 
I'm working on the final details now, but it's looking good. Oh yeah, and I have to book reservations for you. I love giving back to my community. Working in group volunteering can be a great combo of helping important causes and having fun. Of course, you should always look to best while doing any kind of work. That's where my fashion design classes have been an inspiration. In either place, working with groups is my favorite part. No one cares, and most people don't know that I, I am one. Uh, oh, gotta go. I guess I can be considered a team player, whether I'm shooting to homes with my friends or responding to alarms to fire. I'm glad to know I have two teams to count on. I wonder if you know how much important that is. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter to anyone on my team that I am one. One in 26 will be directly affected, and then all will be indirectly affected in their lifetime. Epilepsy is more common than you think. I am one. 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 Find out more at one in 26.org. So one in 26 people will have a C, uh, will have epilepsy. <clears throat> no? So you're not alone um, if you're living with epilepsy. Um, many, many people in the world do have epilepsy. It's very common. About 2.5 million Americans have epilepsy, or and about 65 million people worldwide. It affects more than 315,000 students in the United States, and about 150,000 people will be newly diagnosed with epilepsy each year. And as the video just showed, one in 26 people will develop epilepsy in their lifetime. So it's very common. We oftentimes don't think about that because epilepsy is not something that is um, that we talk about much in our society. Uh, but it actually, it is the fourth most common neurological disorder. So um, under normal circumstances, your brain cells use electrical activity to communicate through neurons or nerve cells and to transmit information. And seizures happen when your brain cells don't act normally, and they cause the nerve cells or the neurons to misfire and send wrong, wrong signals. So when we have a seizure, it's the uh, sudden excessive discharge of electri electrical activity in the brain. And when that happens, it can cause a change in behavior. Um, it can cause abnormal movements, changes in your sensation, or your level of consciousness. Epilepsy is just the tendency to have recurrent seizures. And typically, we talk about these being unprovoked seizures, or seizures that aren't caused by a fever or a chemical abnormality in your brain. So you may have been told that you have seizures that uh, come from a particular area or lobe in your brain. So your brain is made up of uh, two halves, or, uh, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And there are uh, four lobes then in each half of the in, in each half of your brain. So this is a picture that shows that, and you can also see overlaid on uh, the different uh, lobes of the brain some of the different activities that um, those portions of your brain control. So you can see in that middle pink strip there, that's your motor strip. So if you have a seizure that is uh, starting in that area anywhere along in this area, you will have um, motor movements, so jerking, stiffening, that sort of thing. Um, if you have a seizure that in, involves your Broca's area here, the little black spot, then you may have problems with your speech, or back here in Wernicke's area is also an area that's involved in, in uh, nouns, producing nouns. So because epilepsy varies from person to person, it's helpful to examine some critical facts about epilepsy. So I'm going to mention just 10 of them. First off, we like to talk about um, 
people having um, a, a person with epilepsy or a person with a seizure disorder rather than defining them as an epileptic. Because when you talk about uh, someone being an epileptic, that really defines a person by a single trait. So that's just like saying that like I have red hair or somebody has blue eyes, they're short, they're tall. Um, and so you really want to talk about that person as a person, as a whole person, not a single trait. Seizures seldom cause brain damage. Repeated seizures may have a cumulative effect on your brain, but this is rare. So as remember, seizures are a temporary uh, dysfunction or uh, temporary, temporary disruption in your brain function, and it doesn't cause a permanent problem. Just as people in the general population, most people have normal intellect, same thing with people with epilepsy. However, there are people of, uh, in the general population that have a lower IQ, uh, other people have a, a higher IQ. And it's the same thing with people who have epilepsy. Um, they all have differing intellectual abilities. Some people think that people with epilepsy are more violent or have a tendency towards violence, and that is not true. Violence does not follow epilepsy, and there's no greater tendency for violence in people who have seizures or epilepsy. A single seizure less than 10 minutes does not cause brain damage. Again, repeated seizures may have a cumulative effect on your brain, but this is rare. Epilepsy is not a mental illness, and it's not necessarily inherited. Most of the time, um, the cause for it is unknown, or it may be environmental. There may be, there may be some causes for, uh, known causes for seizures, and we will go over that in uh, a little bit later. Most people who have epilepsy require medications, but usually that's for just a small portion of their life. 50 to 60 percent of people are able to stop medication uh, after being seizure-free for two to five years. Of course, this is going to depend upon the cause of your seizures or epilepsy and the type of epilepsy that you have. But just because you're on medication does not now does not necessarily mean that you will be on uh, medication for your entire life. Epilepsy is uh, not a curse. Uh, in the 1490s, witch hunting was, um, you know, people, there were witch hunts that, that focused on finding people with epilepsy because they thought that it was a curse. Uh, but, and so there was lots of stigma, stigma associated with that. But uh, epilepsy, as you all know, is a medical problem. And it is compatible with a normal, happy life. We just need to learn some tips, perhaps, in order to have a, a happier, normal life. So what causes epilepsy? For approximately 70% of people with epilepsy, the cause is either unknown or presumed to be genetic. And for the remaining 30%, the seizures are symptoms of a known cause, uh, such as uh, a lesion or uh, trauma. Some of the causes of symptomatic seizures are um, due to a brain injury at birth. You have brain lesions, so tubers, uh, such as tubers that are associated uh, with tuberous sclerosis. sclerosis. Uh, but you can have um, seizures or epilepsy from any uh, type of brain tumor. Congenital malformations of your brain, so perhaps uh, your brain did not form normally in utero, and so therefore that can be a cause of seizures. Infections of the brain, meningitis, encephalitis. Neurocystrosarcosis is a parasitic infection that uh, can cause seizures, and then poisoning. But even though we know there are, are many causes of, of seizures, it's important to remember that the uh, cause of seizures in epilepsy is oftentimes multifactorial, so it's not always easy to trace it to one specific event or cause. Well, how do we classify seizures? Well, we first break seizures, we break seizures down into two different classifications, partial, partial seizures, which we often refer to as focal seizures, 
Uh, so those are seizures that start in one part of the brain, say this uh, little blue spot here on the uh, cartoon here. If you have a seizure that just is involving that uh, area of your brain, that would be a focal seizure. And again, the symptoms relate to the part of the brain that uh, is affected. Um, if you remember back to the slide I showed earlier where you had all of the different um, uh, types of um, symptoms or, or what areas of the brain that uh, control various uh, body parts and thinking and that sort of thing. Seizures are also classified as generalized seizures. So those are seizures that involve the whole brain. And examples of those would be convulsions, um, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, or uh, what we re uh, co some people commonly call grand mal seizures. You can have just staring uh, events um, and or muscle spasms and or stiffening of your muscles and falling. The most common types of generalized seizures are absence seizures. So those are seizures where you stop and stare. Uh, and generalized tonic-clonic or the grand mal type seizure. So talking about partial seizures then, those are broken down into simple partial seizures. So during a simple partial seizure, you have normal consciousness. You have no loss of consciousness. You can uh, continue to carry on a conversation and, and um, without any problems. We oftentimes refer to these as auras. Then you can also have complex partial seizures. And during a complex partial seizure, you'll have altered consciousness. And those can be manifested in several different ways, again, depending upon what area of your brain is involved. So you may just have some twitching or jerking in uh, one hand or one arm or one leg, one side of your body. Um, you may have some somatos somatosensory, so feelings uh, and sen uh, sensations, tingling. Psychic, so feelings of deja vu, or autonomic, so facial flushing, pupil dilation, those sorts of things. Then partial seizures can also uh, generalize to involve your entire brain. So we refer to those as partial seizures with secondarily gen generalization. Generalized seizures, then we have about um, seven different types of generalized seizures. So again, generalized seizures involve your entire brain pretty much very rapidly or pretty much all, uh, at the onset of the seizure. So again, the most common type of generalized seizures are generalized tonic-clonic, GTC, convulsions, grand mal, those are all terms that we uh, use when we refer to uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Then you can have tonic seizures. So those are seizures where you get stiff, so you may have a rigid extension of your arms and your legs. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can have clonic seizures, so that's jerking, the jerking movement. Myoclonic seizures are also another type of generalized seizure, and those myoclonic seizures are a quick jerk. So it can be a big jerk that's involving your, you know, both arms and your upper torso, or it can may, maybe just be a jerk of one arm or one leg, but those are very brief uh, jerks that don't last a, a long, uh, a long time. Tonic seizures tend to last, you know, a minute or so. Myoclonic seizures, on the other hand, last typically seconds. Atonic seizures are seizures where you suddenly lose tone, so you suddenly get limp and uh, fall. So with atonic seizures, those are uh, when I see children with atonic seizures. These are oftentimes the kiddos that wear the helmets because they can be very um, atonic seizures can ca um, cause injury very easily because you can be walking along and suddenly have an atonic seizure and fall and um, knock out teeth and break bones and, and that sort of thing. So they can be very dangerous and result in injury. Absent seizures were formerly uh, referred to as petty mal. So absent seizures are the seizures where you stop and stare may have some lip smacking or some eyelid fluttering with that, but absence seizures last just a few seconds. But because it involves the entire brain, you have loss of consciousness for those few seconds. Absence seizures uh, often uh, occur, so they can have childhood absence seizures. And those are seizures that typically uh, start somewhere around five years of age, typically 
um, expect children with childhood onset absent seizures to outgrow their seizures. You can also have juvenile onset absent seizures. Typically, we don't expect those um, adolescents then to outgrow their seizures. Um, it's typically a lifelong disorder. And then atypical absence are absence seizures that um, have a little bit uh, different EEG pattern and typically last a little bit longer than the typical absence seizures. So what are some of the seizure triggers in, in precipitants? Well, missing your medicine or taking your medicine late is the number one cause for a breakthrough seizure. And uh, so it's very, very important to make sure that um, you take your medicine on time and use some of the um, reminders to remember to take medicine. I'm horrible at remembering to take medicine, so I have to set a time, an alarm to remember to take any sort of medicine on, on time. Emotional stress for uh, some people with epilepsy can cause breakthrough seizures. Sleep deprivation, so it's very common for um, children who are going to school, and particularly adolescents or college-age students during uh, exams, uh, cramming for, staying up late, cramming for their exam, have sleep deprivation, get up early the next morning, running off for their exam, oh, I forgot my, my medicine, and so it's the perfect storm to have a breakthrough seizure. So it's important as much as, as, as possible to have a regular sleep schedule um, so that you aren't sleep deprived, particularly if you are a particular person that you you recognize that when you um, don't get your sleep that you tend to have more seizures. Hormonal changes can cause seizures, so particularly in our adolescent um, females, they can uh, have more seizures around the time of their period. Alcohol, recreational drugs can cause breakthrough seizures. There's drug-to-drug -drug interactions that sometimes you can have more seizures than missed meals. Uh, for some people, specific foods or drinks they'll notice have they'll have more seizures. That's not common, but it's possible. Some nutritional deficiencies will cause seizures. And then specific stimuli like flashing lights. So people who have absence seizures, flashing lights uh, in a particular frequency can cause um, increased seizures, as can hyperventilation or breathing rapidly. Loud uh, or sudden noises for some people can cause um, breakthrough seizures. So seizure first aid, it's important to remember that most seizures are not a medical an emergency, but you should always have um, you know, a seizure emergency plan. Basic first aid varies depending upon the level of consciousness. So uh, whether there's it's a simple partial seizure with no change in consciousness to a complex partial where you have altered consci consciousness or loss of consciousness with a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, your, your first aid is going to vary depending upon that. But in general, when somebody has a seizure, you should speak softly and remain calm. It's important to time the seizure. Uh, make sure that you have uh, the person in a safe place and protect their privacy as much as possible. So when you're promoting uh, safety, thinking about uh, uh, removing potentially harmful objects from the surrounding area, Cushion their head and, or their arms and legs if possible if they're in a, in a wheelchair. Try to um, <clears throat> cushion their arms and legs if possible. Protect their head. Maintain an open airway, but do not put anything in their mouth. It's a wise, old wives' tale that you can swallow your tongue. That is not true. And you put something in, your mat, in their mouth and you take the risk of them biting your finger, your finger, or uh, occluding their airway. Uh, so it's best to just roll them over on their side and uh, so that if they vomit, um, they don't get that uh, back down in their lungs. And don't restrain them. <clears throat> Remain with the person, it says child, but obviously an adult as well, until they're fully conscious. Don't give them anything to eat or drink until they're able to swallow. And it's common to be sleepy after a seizure, particularly a complex partial seizure or definitely after a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, it's common to be sleepy. So they may need to rest for a little while. Make sure that they haven't been injured. And if a seizure lasts more than five minutes or there, another seizure begins before they regain full awareness, then um, again, this is where your emergency 
uh, protocol comes into play. So when is a seizure an emergency? Well, if it's a first-time seizure, if it's a, a convulsive seizure that's lasted more than five minutes, then you need to think about um, giving diastat or whatever your seizure emergency plan is. Uh, repeated seizures without regaining consciousness. If you're having more seizures than usual or the type of seizure has changed, then that might be an emergency for you. Someone who has diabetes or is pregnant, a seizure um, is, would be an emergency. Obviously, if they were injured, and any time a seizure occurs um, in water, in the swimming pool, it's an emergency, and that person should be seen um, in, the, in the emergency room. Even if you think that they haven't, that they're okay, it's wise to get them uh, evaluated in the emergency room to make sure they haven't gotten water into their lungs. So seizure action plan, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide here, um, I'm not sure how well that's actually projecting, but there's a managing epilepsy and seizure um, kind of flyer that I have there. And that's actually available through the Epilepsy Foundation, and I think we've uh, attached that as uh, one of the handouts for this uh, webinar. So uh, I think that that can be sometimes helpful I've had parents tell me that that's helpful to give to the babysitter or to grandparents and um, or even to the school because it gives you some guidelines on what to do to make the, uh, the house safer and what to do during a seizure. So again, it's important to have a seizure action plan for sure if you have a child with seizures, but even if you're an adult, it's an important for um, whoever your support system is to have an action plan or know what to do for you if you're having a seizure. Some safety precautions, use non-breakable dishes, cook with a microwave. It's important to take a shower, not a bath. You can drown in the bathtub if you had a seizure in the bathtub. And uh, you might think about um, using a seizure alert monitor. There are several of those out on the market. Uh, that might be something that you might find useful. <clears throat> So how do we treat epilepsy? Well, there are four treatment options for epilepsy. Medications is always our first line treatment. The ketogenic diet is a high fat diet that we use uh, more so in children than in adults um, for treatment of epilepsy. There's the vagus nerve stimulator, and then there's uh, epilepsy surgery. And I'll uh, talk briefly about each one of those treatment options. Our goals, though, for, our, for any of our treatment and therapy is to maximize quality of life. So in order to do that, we want to stop as many seizures as possible. Um, you know, we can typically stop seizures, but, um, you know, if we've had to give you so much medicine that you're sleeping all the time or you're in a coma, then that's not quality of life. So, uh, again, we want to stop as many seizures as possible, but avoid as many adverse effects from therapy as possible. And then we want to prevent the psychosocial consequences of epilepsy because we know that those can have a significant impact on quality of life. So as I've already said, anti-seizure medicine is the primary way to control seizures. There are different uh, anti-seizure medications help with different kinds of epilepsy and seizures. So that's why it's important to know and why your healthcare provider um, wants to know and needs to determine what type of seizures you are having. Are you having partial seizures or are you having generalized seizures? And then, you know, from the generalized seizures, what type of generalized seizures those are. Um, we have medications that treat some types of seizures and some types of epilepsy and epilepsy syndrome better than others. Anti-seizure medications don't fix the problem. They only treat the, the seizures. And seizures, I don't think I said this earlier, but they're really a symptom of an underlying brain problem. So again, I guess I alluded to that. So there's a cause for your seizures. So um, you know, if you had a scar on your brain, it's from that scar that's causing the seizures. So medicine controls seizures in about seven out of 10 people. And the other people, um, other 30% or three out of 10, uh, continue to have seizures despite treatment with um, seizure medications, and we refer to those people as having refractory or intractable epilepsy. 
So in 2016, we have over 20 different medications that we can use to treat epilepsy or seizures. Phenobarbital is one of the oldest and was the first anti-seizure medication to come out on the market. So we still use it, although um, we uh, don't use it um, as much as we used to. Phenytoin or Dilantin. Um, is another uh, seizure medication, again, one of the older medicine. Actually, all the seizures, all, all the medications on this slide, these first six medications, we would kind of refer to as the old medications. So these were all the medications, only seizure medications that were available to us uh, prior to about 1990. And since then, we've had lots and lots of medications come out on the market to use for treatment of seizures. So I'm not going to go through each one of these specifically, uh, but these are kind of our older medications. Ethosuximide or Zerotin is one of the common medications that we use to treat absence seizures. Tegretol or Carbitol is um, one of, again, one of the older medications that's uh, typically used to treat partial, complex partial seizures. Valproate and uh, Depakon is actually the IV form of valproate, so uh, we still use Depakote or valproate a fair amount, but again, it's one of our older medications, and it's good to treat um, generalized type seizures. So here we go with the other epilepsy medications that we have available out on the market. So Felvitol um, is a good medication, but it has lots of potential risks. Sabril or Vigabitrin, um, used to treat infantile spasms, um, particularly if you have a baby who has infantile spasms and tuberous sclerosis, it's the um, treatment of choice for, um, first treatment of choice for infantile spasms uh, in that population. Gabapentin, um, don't use too much as a seizure medicine. It's now uh, found to be more um, useful as a pain medicine. Um, or neuropathic pain, so nerve pain. Um, Lamictal, whoops. Uh, Lamictal is good to treat partial as well as generalized seizures. Topiramate, um, so there's some extended release products out there, Trochindi XR and Qdexy XR, so those are one time a day dose, um, dosing schedule. So um, you can see that back up with the Lamictal, Lamictal, there's an extended release. So if you are someone who has a hard time remembering to take medicines. Um, you know, some of these extended release products might be something that you uh, might find useful and you might want to talk to your health care provider about because they are typically, um, well, they're made to be able to give one time a day. So, you know, if you only have to remember to take something once a day, obviously it's much, e much easier than if you have to remember to take it two or three times a day. Trileptal or oxcarbazepine. Uh, also a very good medicine. We use it a lot to treat partial onset seizures. Keppra, Zonagran, Pregabalin, Lyrica. Uh, you probably have seen more advertisements on television for Lyrica for partial onset seizure or for pain. Again, neuropathic pain. But we also use that to treat seizures. Banzel or Rafenamide we use to treat more uh, generalized type seizures. Vimpat is uh, partial, but also some generalized seizures. ACTH or Actar gel, um, only really used to treat infantile spasms um, in, in babies, and that's an um, injection um, med medicine that you'd have to give uh, with an injection. Clobazam or Omphi, one of our newer medicines. Patiga also one of our newer medicines that's just come out in the last couple of years. I don't think too many people are using it at this point, but I know there are some, but there are some specific side effects associated with that that uh, have um, limited the use for some people. Aptium and Ficompa are the last two newest medications out on the market. Again, good for Aptium for partial uh, onset seizures and Ficompa more for generalized uh, seizures. All of the anti-seizure medicines have uh, potential side effects, just as any medicine actually has side potential side effects. Uh, so you have to, you know, and some of those are dose related. So if you're having side effects from your medicine, it's important to talk to your healthcare provider to let them know and see if there's a different regimen you could come up with or 
a different seizure medicine that you could perhaps try and be um, better tolerated. There are rescue medicines that we can use. So diazepam uh, <clears throat> or the diastat, rectal diastat, we use for uh, prolonged or cluster seizures. Also, sometimes we use clonopin or Ativan for long seizures. More and more people are using the midazolam or the intranasal, um, given intranasally. That's still investigational here in the United States, but uh, the drug study, we have the drug studies going on, and so hopefully that'll be something that will be uh, more readily available in the near future so that perhaps we can use that instead of having to use the rectal bias there. There are several uh, reminders, uh, ways to remember to take your medicine. So um, using medication record forms, pill boxes, I kind of like this texting for control. That's good for particularly some of the adolescents have liked that. And I have the website here. You can download that, and um, it gives you uh, text messages to give you a reminder as to when to take your medicine. So some people have found that to be a helpful um, way to remember. So other treatment options, there are dietary treatments and vagus nerve stimulation and surgery. So with the dietary therapy, there are three different diet therapies, ketogenic diet, modified Atkins, and low glycemic. Index treatment, they all are low carbohydrate. The ketogenic diet, though, is very high in fat. We provide adequate protein and low carbohydrates. It works because that when you eat high fat um, then, and restrict your carbohydrates, uh, it forces the body to use fat for its source of energy. And then um, when you do that, ketones are uh, produced in the urine. And then you can also measure it in your blood in the form of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, and then the brain uses the ketones in place of, of the glucose for energy. And then you can measure the uh, ketones in the urine using those little strips that you see in that picture. The ketogenic diet is, uh, is a challenge, and it's certainly not for everyone. It's very high in fat and low in carbohydrates. So unless you really, really like lots of fat in your diet, it doesn't taste very good. So many kids refuse to eat it. It's difficult for people who are uh, you know, intellectually um, normal and um, teenagers who like to hang out with their friends. There's no eating at McDonald's and that sort of thing. So it's really quite a challenge. Um, you have to be strict adherence to it. You can't cheat on it, otherwise it puts you at risk for uh, having uh, repeated seizures. And all the medicines must be low in carbohydrates. So you can't, uh, most liquid medications have too much carbohydrate in it, so uh, that's another challenge. Here's a few pictures of some uh, ketogenic diet foods. So that one picture there on the left, that's some macaroni and cheese. Avocado is a natural 4 to 1 ratio, so 4 parts fat to 1 part carbohydrate and protein. So that's a good food to use on the ketogenic diet. Um, so just a few pictures there. We now also have some ketogenic formulas that uh, we can use. So that's made it a lot easier than it used to be back 10 or 15 years ago to administer the diet. This slide just gives you an idea of comparing the Comparing the um, American diet here on the right, you can see it's about 30% fat uh, and about 50% carbohydrate compared to the ketogenic diet on the left uh, that's 90% fat and 4% carbohydrate. So you can see the um, big difference in uh, composition of the diet for a ketogenic diet. Modified Atkins, you still restrict carbohydrates and we encourage high fat foods, but we don't limit the protein um, and you don't have to weigh and measure everything. On the ketogenic diet, you have to weigh and measure everything on a gram scale, including the liquid that you take in. So for modified Atkins, you just read the food labels, which makes it somewhat easier, but reading food labels isn't necessarily easy. This gives you um, just a kind of a pictorial representation also, so you can see that, yes, it's high in fat, but it's not the 90% that from the strict ketogenic diet, it's more like 60 to 65% fat. So a little bit more palatable, gives you a few more options 
than the strict ketogenic diet. Then low glycemic index treatment, um, we're still limiting the amount of carbohydrates, but we're, um, and so you can use a little bit, you have more variety on the use of the carbohydrates, and we're really looking at uh, limiting to the carbohydrates with, that have a low glycemic index of less than 50. So um, glycemic index, when we talk about that, that's the um, measure of food's tendency to elevate blood glucose. So things that have a high glycemic index are things like watermelon, bagels, potatoes, low glycemic. So things that would be allowed on the diet would be things like apples, cucumbers, and whole grains. We monitor the protein, fat, and calories. But again, um, it's uh, not weighed on a gram scale. So it does give you a little bit more variety. And um, again, just a pictorial representation here. How effective is it? Um, ketogenic diet can be about 50% about of people will have a 50% reduction in seizures. Numbers vary using uh, strict ketogenic, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, modified Atkins versus low glycemic, but the, we're having more and more studies uh, with being done with that and showing that they can be nearly as effective for some people as the strict ketogenic diet. So I use the low glycemic and modified Atkins diet for kids that um, I know aren't going to eat all that high fat. And so I have a number of children that are on low glycemic or modified Atkins that have had actually um, improved seizure control and uh, been able to be adherent to the diet. Another treatment option is the vagus nerve stimulator. Um, it's designed to prevent seizures by sending electrical impulses to the brain. Sometimes we refer to that as a pacemaker for the brain. And so you can see in the picture on the side there, there's a device that, uh, much like, the, like a pacemaker, that's implanted in the left upper chest. And then you can see the wire that's tunneled underneath the skin. And then in the little sidebar there, that uh, wire is then wrapped around the vagus nerve. Um, we have two vagus nerves, one on the left and one on the right. And we uh, use the left vagus nerve because most of those impulses go upward to the brain. So we want to pace the brain, so to speak. It also comes with a magnet. Um, it's watch style or pager style that uh, you can use at the onset of a seizure. And so that initiates an on-demand stimulation. And in about 70% of times, it can abort or decrease the severity of the seizures. And it can also improve the post period, so that uh, sleepy period um, after the seizure, um, it can uh, oftentimes it reduce that. You can also use that magnet if you're having uh, side effects or oftentimes, or sometimes with the, with the stimulator, you'll have a little bit of um, uh, your voice change when the during, just during the time the stimulation is occurring. So if you're singing or have a public speaking engagement and you don't want that uh, your voice to change, you can actually stop the stimulation by uh, just holding that magnet over the uh, generator. And then surgery is another potential option uh, for treatment of seizures, particularly um, and you may be a candidate if you have difficult to control seizures, or what I was referring to earlier as refractory seizures, those seizures that aren't controlled with medications. But before we can determine whether you're an, a candidate for, seizure, uh, for surgery, we have to do lots of tests. So um, because we want to see, um, make sure that we're going to be able to give you maximum seizure control after surgery, and we want to minimize the disruption of the normal brain function. We don't want to cause more injury. We want to actually improve your life. So part of that evaluation, uh, we need to determine exactly where in the brain the seizures are starting. So say, for instance, we so to do that, we bring you into the monitoring unit and uh, record seizures. And again, what we're interested in is what part of the brain is that seizure starting at? We don't care where it really, we're not really that interested in where it spreads to. We want to know where it starts, because it's that area then that we're hoping that we can reset. But again, if that's starting in an area where your speech is involved, then you might not be a good candidate, because obviously we don't want to leave you without speech. Um, so there's a 
lengthy, detailed evaluation that goes on uh, prior to determining whether uh, you're a candidate for epilepsy surgery. Um, the basically rest of the slide can speak for itself here. Um, talked about the prolonged EEG monitoring, um, MRI of the brain to determine if there's a um, abnormality in your brain, so is there a scar there or a cortical dysplasia, an area of the brain that didn't form quite correctly. Um, if that, if the, the, the seizures are starting from the same areas where we see that abnormality on the brain, then you are, are more likely to be a candidate for epilepsy surgery, but again, it depends upon where that abnormality is and if it's in a vital portion, uh, part of the brain. We also do neuropsychological testing. Uh, it helps us localize brain uh, function, um, determine what's your dominant hemisphere for language as well as memory. And then just to speak a little bit about the consequences of intractable epilepsy. We know that having uh, ongoing seizures that are disrupting uh, your life can have a, a significant impact on education. So as I already said, most people who have epilepsy, their uh, IQs are within the normal range. But having epilepsy increases the risk of learning problems by um, three times, so three times greater than average. And just having seizures or being uh, on medication can cause you to have difficulty with memory, attention, and concentration. <clears throat> So again, if we can control those seizures or get rid of those seizures with uh, epilepsy surgery, then uh, we can hopefully uh, decrease the negative impact on your educational education. And for some people, it's important to remember uh, if you have children in school, they may be eligible for special education and related services. And that also um, includes when you go off to college. So. Um, Children who have had uh, some of the 504 plans in their um, high school, look into that as your um, young adults are moving off to college because there are some services available through the college um, that are similar. We know that epilepsy can have a negative impact on the ability to get a job. There, things come up like, well, do I tell my employer or do I not, until, not tell my employer? Um, but, you know, everybody wants a job because that, for one thing, that provides um, a sense of accomplishment, you know, we all want to be somebody someday, and it's one step towards independence, particularly for um, those adolescents and young adults that uh, we take care of. Driving can be a problem. Um, the laws vary by state, so particularly if you're moving to a different state, um, then you'll need to check with the motor vehicle department to uh, see what their law is in that state. Here in the state of Texas, uh, the law recently changed, well, it's probably been over a year ago now, but it changed so that now you have to be seizure-free for three months before uh, you can get a driver's license. It used to be six months. And Seizures can have a negative impact on psychosocial and emotional development. So we know for particularly for children, you can have it can delay their social development, it can impair their independence, um, they can develop a low self-esteem, have anxiety, and there can be lots of stigma associated with uh, having seizures. So that's why it's important to um, you know, talk as a family, have some family time, or have a great support system so that um, you can um, improve self-esteem. Um, resources like the Epilepsy Foundation um, are good. They have um, many activities to learn more about epilepsy. They have camps that are good for the kiddos to go off to camp, see, be with other uh, children and adolescents who have seizures, and that can do a lot to improve their self-esteem and um, sense of, it, of independence. So just in, in closing, I've left a, I put a couple of resources here. So the National Epilepsy Foundation, www.epilepsy.com, has lots and lots of resources. I encourage you to go on there. They have um, a great um, website with, that breaks out all the different types of seizures, 
you have seizure action plans on there you can download for the school if you need one for the school, um, tips for staying safe, and then the Epilepsy Foundation of Texas. Again, we have one of the best camping programs for epilepsy um, that I know of, um, actually nationwide, and the Epilepsy Foundation has uh, lots and lots of different support groups available. So I think that's my end. So yeah, uh, in closing, remember you're not alone. Work with your medical team, stay informed, seek support, and um, don't give up. Any questions? Well, yes, we do. Thank you very much for that. I always like listening to you and your presentation. <laughs> They're always very informative. And we do have a couple of questions that came in while you were speaking. Um, the first one says, um, as a health service, service coordinator for a school district in the Houston area, we are beginning to see physician orders for intranasal um, um, midazolam, midazolam. midazolam to abort a prolonged seizures. Do you feel this drug is appropriate in the school setting? And if so, could you speak to any procedures or precautions that the school nurse should take? Um, that's a good question. And so um, I'm not surprised you're seeing more and more orders for using the intranasal uh, midazolam. Even though it's still you know, considered investigational, I know that um, just like many drugs, we, we use many drugs off-label. So we use midazolam all the time in the hospital to, to stop seizures. It just hasn't been approved to use, well, it's still investigational, as I said, to use uh, intranasally. But many people are writing for that. So as a school nurse, I would just make sure that you have clear orders from the healthcare provider as to you know, how to administer it and um, you know, what signs and symptoms to look for, safety precautions. It's actually you know, found to be pretty safe, but um, um, that's what I would do as a school nurse. Just make sure you have some good orders and, and guidelines to follow, just like you would with the diastat. Great, and thank you for that question, um, Barbara Robertson. If um, you need any further um, answer, you can always uh, reach me and um, we can get you more information. Um, the next question we have is from Dr. Lonnie Schwartz. Might a sudden loss of eyesight, almost like a partial uh, retina detachment, grain of the eyesight be a seizure? Is that a, oh, well, if it's a permanent uh, loss, that's what makes a webinar interesting here, because I have a question for you to answer, <laughs> so I can answer that. But anyway, if, you, if, if that's a, him, he might be able to respond. Okay, so if that's a, like you've lost that eyesight now and it's not just an intermittent, then I would say definitely no. If it's kind of a come and go, I still, it's probably not, but because typically you don't get blindness with a seizure. Um, although you can have some, you know, blurry vision and that sort of thing. So hard for me to answer that question, I guess, but the information that you've given me. Okay. Um, uh, I guess just so... He says no, the loss is come and go. Yeah. So, yeah, and without any other symptoms? Yeah. So, but I would guess, you know, I would um, always defer you back to your, your health care provider and ask about that because uh, certainly that's not normal, so I would be wondering why that's happening. Whether that's actually is, you know, is that might not be a seizure, but having off and on uh, loss of vision is certainly not normal, and so should be evaluated. Okay. Well, we don't, we have only five minutes left, but um, just a question that oh, oh, he says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any um, age? Is any ages? What's the age that um, the DNS usually start? You know, how, how young can they uh, be to, to contain that one? How, how young in the uh, ketogenic diet, surgery, what's the youngest? Okay, so what's the youngest for um, vagus nerve stimulation? So vagus nerve stimulation is FDA approved, for, so approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in um, adolescents 12 years and older. Just like many medications are uh, FDA approved for, you know, various ages. So it can be 4 to, you know, through adulthood or 16. 
but we use many, many, many medications off-label, meaning it's not FDA approved for that age. So with uh, vagusar stimulation, we use it off-label all the time. Again, it's, um, I think I said this, but I don't know what I said. So 12 and older for partial onset seizures. So we use it for younger than that, and we also use it to treat generalized seizures as well. So the youngest that we have implanted at our institution is six months, but that was, uh, you have to be about 10 kilos, so around 22 pounds before um, you have, you have to be about that size in order for the device to, to fit in your body. Um, so you can use it very young. And um, ketogenic diet, actually I have, uh, the youngest who can use it in infants, it's really on the other end of the spectrum. So adolescents and adults, it's often more difficult, particularly um, if you're eating everything by mouth. And actually a challenge here in the Houston area is that we don't have any adult epilepsy program who offers the ketogenic diet. So um, might find somebody that could help you with a modified Atkins or a low glycemic, but actually I'm not aware of anyone that's actually doing that. So the, it's more of a challenge given the diet uh, on an at a, at a adult, older adolescent, adult age. And epilepsy surgery is um, any age you're a candidate for that. It's really that you have refractory seizures and you failed medicines and you know we can see that you have an area of brain that's abnormal and that's where all your seizures are coming from and we're not going to give you more dysfunction by doing epilepsy surgery. And the last question we have is, is it okay to swim if you have epilepsy? Is it okay to swim if you have epilepsy? So that I would say we always want to um, have uh, people be have the least restriction so you know again we want you to live as normal a life as possible you should always swim with a buddy but that's we should always all swim with a buddy even if we don't have epilepsy so I would say though if you have poorly controlled seizures that it's probably not very safe to swim um, and so I would do that with great caution and definitely have a buddy in the water at your side if you were going to do that. Um, if you have well-controlled seizures, again, let the lifeguard know that you have seizures. Let whoever you're with know you have seizures so that they can be on the lookout for you. But, um, you know, it's probably okay, but you need to take safety precautions and, and let people know so that they can be looking at for, out for you. Well, that was the last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Schultz. You were wonderful. Um, we are getting ready to close out this webinar, but I would like to remind everyone that at the end of the webinar, there is a survey. It is very important if you can uh, complete that survey and, um, you know, so that we can have some feedback about this webinar, um, how well you liked it. Um, please let us know how many people were on with you. And uh, we we'll also want to remind you next Thursday, we also have the, the third uh, part of this series, um, which is um, new normal, and it's, uh, you know, for newly diagnosed families or families that are, that are still um, trying to make a, create a, new, a normal environment um, with someone living with epilepsy in the family and, and it's uh, implementing some normalcy. So that will be at the same time uh, next week, next Thursday, 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.